In this video, I'm going to talk about the top seven problems that you will face if you install a solar panel system on a recreational vehicle. Throughout this video, I'm going to use the term RVs, but most of these challenges and tips can be applied to any kind of travel trailer or boat just as well. One other thing that I wanted to mention real quick is that in all of my videos, I try to find pictures that are free to use and are not copyright protected. But unfortunately, that is very difficult to do, and sometimes I have to make a guess. So if I have inadvertently borrowed your picture without permission, I apologize. Please contact me at ldsreliance at gmail.com. So having said all that, let's go ahead and get started with the first problem, which is limited roof space. RVs and travel trailers are compact and efficient to fit as much living space and as many amenities as possible in a lightweight, portable package. So the roof space is limited with such a small footprint, but it gets worse because the roof has several things already installed on it, such as vents, air conditioners, and skylights, which further decreases the amount of real estate you have to work with. And to make things even worse, the roof's not flat, so the same mounting systems that are used on homes usually cannot be used and don't have as much control over the orientation of the panels to maximize your sun exposure. To solve this problem, there are a few strategies. The first is to use a ground-mounted string of solar panels in addition to a string of solar panels on the roof. Ground-mounted panels can be deployed easily when you get to your campsite, fishing spot, or boondocking location and have the added benefit of being able to be moved throughout the day to track the sun, something that your roof-mounted panels cannot do. Multiple strings of solar panels can be connected to a simple combiner box before feeding into your solar charge controller, and the MC4 connectors that you see on the left side can be easily disconnected so that the ground mount can be stowed away. Another strategy is to focus more on decreasing your electrical consumption so that you can get by with just the panels you can fit on your roof. For example, instead of packing that electricity guzzling coffee maker, invest in a propane unit instead. For those of you interested, I'll put a link to this one in the video description. Remember, it's easier and cheaper to decrease demand than it is to increase supply when it comes to solar. The second problem that you're going to run into is how to penetrate the roof. During the installation, the wires from your solar panels on the roof will need to enter the interior of the RV or trailer. But just drilling a hole and pulling them through can damage the structure of the RV and allow rain to seep in and do damage. One option you can use to get the wires inside is to look for an existing entry point, such as a vent. You can usually make some modifications to the vent to allow wires to enter without risking the rest of the structure. If that won't work for you or you're not comfortable with that, then you'll have to create a new entry point. Use cable glands like this one that are made for RVs. They're designed to be weatherproof and they're perfectly sized for solar wiring. Again, I'll put an Amazon link in the video description so you know what I'm talking about. The third problem you're going to run into is how to install this safely. Batteries store a lot of energy and can easily start a fire in your RV or boat if there's a short circuit. There aren't clearly defined building codes for RVs like there are for homes, and they're not governed by the NEC. There's a lot of conflicting information out there on the internet, so it can be confusing to understand how to properly protect your investment from damage. To make sure your whole system is safe, I recommend using a properly sized breaker switch in series with the positive wiring of each leg of the system. In other words, connect a breaker between the solar panels and your charge controller, between the charge controller and your batteries, and between your batteries and the inverter. You can use fuses as well, but they obviously only work once and then you have to replace the fuse. Whichever one you choose, as long as the output leads of the battery are either fused or on a breaker, the system is safe from any faults and grounding to the chassis or to the earth is not necessary and can actually sometimes even lead to problems. Now the fourth problem you'll only run into if you're planning on using lithium batteries, and that is that there is limited OEM manufacturer support for lithium. While lithium batteries have been around for several years now in the solar world, they've not yet become common in RVs. The OEM electrical systems are designed to work with lead-acid batteries and are not compatible with lithium. So without some modifications and replacement components, you're stuck using lead-acid batteries. 
The good news is that lithium compatible converter chargers are now hitting the aftermarket. This is the main component you'll need to replace in your RV to be able to use the rest of the system as is. Most RV dealers will install it for you and then you can install your solar panel system as a completely separate system where the only common point is the battery. This seems to be the best option to be able to keep the ability to use shore power and or charge the system with your alternator or a generator to supplement the solar panel system like the OEM system is designed to do. If you don't have a generator and don't need to use shore power, you can rip and replace the whole system and install your own. Worst case, you'll still have the option to use an outdoor extension cable and a battery charger to top off your battery in a pinch. The fifth problem you're going to have is where do you install all the components that you're going to need for your solar power system. Most RVs don't have an abundance of storage space or obvious locations to mount your solar charge controller, safety equipment, battery monitor, inverter, and other electrical components. To make it even more challenging, you'll have to find a space where you can terminate the wiring for the entire RV. So some cupboards and closets won't work very well with limited access to the roof entry point and the converter charger. The first and best location is to mount your solar equipment where the OEM converter charger and fuse block are located since all of the electrical wiring for the RV is already terminated there. Unfortunately, in most of the RVs that I've seen, there's not enough extra room in this location to add all of the rest of the components. So if that won't work, find a shelf or a closet that will allow you to pull wire from the roof and over to the rest of the RV electrical system. This will require drilling holes for wires and drilling screws into a mounting surface, so make sure that the location you choose is constructed with materials that you can drill through and will support the weight of the components. Avoid exterior storage locations unless they are weatherproof and secure. Problem number six is air conditioning. No list of challenges for solar is complete without mentioning air conditioning. Unfortunately, in 2020, solar panels and battery power storage are not efficient enough given the space constraints that we're working with in an RV to generate enough power to operate an air conditioner the same way that you're used to in your home. I know, I know, there are YouTube videos out there that claim they run their air conditioner just fine with their tiny solar panel system. But I promise you there's more to the story they aren't showing you in their clickbait video. The math doesn't lie, folks. It's simply not possible to leave an RV air conditioner running at a set temperature point like you do in your home around the clock. The only ways to get around this problem are to either modify your expectations and usage habits, which a lot of us aren't going to be willing to do, or use a generator or other power source to supplement the power from the solar. Now, running a generator at night probably isn't feasible, so one idea would be to top off the batteries with the generator in the evening right before bed. Do this as late in the evening as possible, and depending on the capacity of your battery bank and energy consumption of your air conditioner, you may have enough power storage to last until the morning when the solar panels can start working again. Another possible solution if you live in a dry climate is to switch over to a swamp cooler or evaporative cooler. Swamp coolers use much less power and it may be possible to run one off your solar power without any help from other power sources. And last but not least, problem number seven is overcast and rainy days. Again, this is an issue for any solar panel system, not just in RVs. But in a typical off-grid solar application, I advise people to add in at least 48 hours of backup energy storage and solar panel production to get through extended periods of overcast conditions. Unfortunately, with the limited space in RVs, this just isn't practical or isn't possible. You may be able to add more batteries or switch to higher density batteries like lithium, but without a corresponding increased number of solar panels, the battery bank will never fully charge. It's critical that your battery bank capacity and your solar panel production output are carefully tuned so that your batteries will fully charge every day, assuming that your battery bank is correctly sized for your consumption. And to make matters worse, when it's raining outside, that usually means you'll be inside the RV more, and that translates to more power consumption from lights, fans, entertainment, and communication devices, etc. One idea to help mitigate this problem is to pack a lithium power generator in your gear. 
Now this won't completely solve the problem, but it will help offset some of the lost production for a short period of time. Basically, if it's raining and overcast and your solar battery bank is not charging very well, pull out one of these generators to recharge laptops and cell phones and power your plug-in kitchen appliances and so forth to take those loads off of your RV electrical system. I've reviewed at least a half a dozen of these devices over the years and most of them will work great for loads of about 300 watts to 400 watts or less. Then when the sun is shining again or you have an opportunity to plug in the power generator to grid power, you can recharge it and stow it away for another rainy day. That'll do it for this video. If you're new to my channel, please hit subscribe. Thanks for watching.